Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, where we will be covering the Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant Program for fiscal year 2023. Our presenter today is Teresa Hunkapiller, Grants Management Specialist with the Rural Utility Service. Teresa? Good morning, everyone. Just wanted to say welcome to the first of two FY 2023 USDA Distance Learning and Telemedicine Grant webinars. Uh, we will have another one next Wednesday at the same time, and we will be covering the same material. Of course, there will be a variety of Q&As at the end that may pick up on some uh, different questions than what we experienced today. We have a lot of material to cover, so I'm not going to be going in depth on every single slide. The slides will be available uh, for your use, plus we provide with a lot of other resources, and we will mention that all throughout the presentation. I'm going to hit the basics of the projects uh, of the program and what makes a good project and dedicate a little time to things that have caused questions in the past. And I want to reiterate, you'll hear me repeating a few things throughout the um, morning, so you will know when we get through uh, the things that I have repeated over and over, I feel are very, very important. So with this, I'm going to touch on the agenda. I'm going to introduce the DLT program. What is eligibility and that from the standpoint of who, what type entity, and what, what type program, what type of equipment. Also, I'm going to touch on completing an application. And before we finish, then Alexa Petty will give you a live demo of uh, the calculation of rurality and the DLT map. Then we will again share available resources and go into a Q&A. I'm going to try to preserve a significant amount of time for Q&A and we can get uh, end up into other topics if we don't use up all of our Q&A time. So with that, let's go. All right. The DLT program is uh, codified in law in the United States Code 950, and we are have a regulation that is 7 CFR 1734, part, subparts A and B. This is the actual Code of Federal Regulations that governs what we do and how we do it. Uh, we also have a publish the notice of solicitation of applications, and it also gives more detail. And we also have a very lengthy DLT application guide, which gives even more detail. I will make note if for any reason anything has uh, not been caught in our screening, the regulation will be the ultimate source. So if, if you accidentally find something along in the application guide that uh, does not line up with regulation, then uh, indeed the regulation is our source. Okay. Distance learning. This is where you'll probably start hearing me repeat phrases. Distance learning means real-time interactive, real-time interactive, real-time interactive, real-time interactive. Same with telemedicine. This is real-time interactive. This is basically to help people in rural areas have an experience of a doctor visit or a medical care visit or ex, uh, experience an educational environment just as if they were there one-on-one -on -one with the teacher or they are one-on-one -on -one with the medical professional. So real-time interactive is the key to this program. Uh, telemedicine means a lot of things to a lot of people, and I, we keep this very neat and concise. It has to be real-time, and it has to be interactive for it to be one of our fundable DLT program projects, okay? And I wanted to touch on changes for this year. Um, We've always been accustomed to using the DUNS number. This has now been changed to the UEI, Unique Entity Identifier. Uh, this is within SAM.gov, and we will discuss SAM.gov registration a little bit more later on. Uh, scoring criteria for special consideration points changes up each year, and this year is no exception. 
We will get into those more in depth a little later. And we are now funding cybersecurity software if it is directly related to the funded project and an eligible grant purpose. So we can't fund cybersecurity for just anything, but it has become a very crucial part of our everyday life that we protect our uh, the integrity of our data and the privacy. So cybersecurity software directly related is now being funded. Okay. And now let's talk a little bit about eligibility. To be eligible for the DLT program, you must be one of the following entities, and that is an incorporated organization, a tribe, state or local unit of government, and yes, uh, that does include um, institutions of higher education, school, school districts, uh, we anything that is incorporated or that is legally um, constructed, if you will, uh, entity. We do not fund individuals and we do not fund the traditional partnerships that are not set up as a legal entity. A uh, consortium is a world unto itself, and we will discuss that should anyone want to delve deeper into it. But we have lots of resources, and this is taken into consideration in the DLT guide uh, pretty significantly. If you want to apply as a formal consortium and let the actual consortium that is an entity of itself be the owner, that's almost no different than uh, an uh, individual organization applying. However, if you're an informal consortium or if you're a formal consortium that wants all of the participating parties to own and be uh, party to the uh, requirements, responsibilities, and ownership of equipment, then you get into a little bit longer detailed legal contracting capacity with everyone having to uh, provide all of the legal information such as their UEI and SAM registration. So if you're very interested in consortium, we will be happy to work with you. I will tell you it is a little bit cumbersome uh, in, unless you have a really burning desire to do that. Okay, let's continue on with eligibility. And that's a little bit more information on in the consortium. Um, the very bottom point there is if it is an informal consortium, each individual entity must contract with RUS in its own behalf. And that gets a little cumbersome. Let's say you have uh, 38 end user sites. And if you do, then that doesn't mean there'll be 38 legal agreements, but that does mean 38 people have to establish their identity, their legal capacity and sign. So that's why I say it's a little bit cumbersome. Okay, let's go a little further. The traditional and continuing uh, eligibility requirements is a minimum morality score of 20 points. This we will cover a little bit more in morality. The uh, matching contribution must be at least 15%. Again, this will get discussed a little further. Uh, tribal resolution of consent. We have not been requiring a resolution of consent. We have been accepting a letter from someone from the tribe, and that is no longer the case. It does have to be a tribal resolution. If you are a non-tribal applicant and you plan to serve um, on a tribal land, you must have a tribal government resolution of consent. There is a sample to this in the Appendix A of the application guide. And we have not changed our minimum and maximum um, amounts. The minimum is 50,000 and the maximum is a million. Okay. We have um, the purposes that are eligible are installing by lease or purchase eligible equipment. I will caution on the lease. The lease can only be through the end of the three year period where the grant ends. The grant actually is considered to begin when we release your funds. Um, all equipment has to be new and non-depreciated and you have to convince us that you're going to be able to sustain this project beyond the life of three years. And if you're leasing equipment for three years, you've got to show us what your plans are for after that three years for equipment to keep this running. 
Uh, we do allow purchases of extended warranty, site license, and maintenance contracts as long as they are committed to upfront when you make the purchases of the related equipment. Uh, acquiring and developing instructional programming that is a capital asset. This cannot be done by the awardee staff. This is purchasing from a third party instructional programming or course material. Uh, we can also get into a little deeper discussion with that if, if someone is interested. Uh, providing technical assistance and instruction for using the eligible equipment. The term technical assistance is another term that means different things to different people. In this case, it is just discussing the technical assistance for learning to use the equipment purchased in this grant. It's not technical assistance going forward. Technical assistance going forward be, would be wrapped into a maintenance contract or some extended warranties. The 10% limit applies to the technical assistance that you get from the vendor uh, that we will fund for instruction on using eligible equipment that's purchased. And the final point is we can purchase and you can purchase and install some broadband facilities, but these facilities must be owned by the applicant. They cannot be owned by the local telephone company or internet service provider. And this is limited to 20% of the requested grant match, I mean, the grant amount. Okay, let's go a little further. Examples of eligible equipment are computer hardware and software, visual equipment, monitors, the things that we standardly consider. Plus, of course, I mentioned that we've added cybersecurity. The equipment that you include in this must have the predominant purpose of this DLT project. And it cannot be something that is just general in use. It can't be a general telephone system that you need throughout your facility or a, a PA system or um, any of those type things. It must be for this purpose. This, this is the reason that you're getting it. Uh, you would not be purchasing it otherwise and your grant project cannot be done without it. So that's kind of how we determine if it's eligible. Uh, just because we have it listed on the screen does not make it eligible. It's the use. You know, you're going to get computer hardware and software, but if it is not being used more than 50% of the time for this particular project that you have proposed, then it's not eligible. So it needs to be connected to the network, being crucial to providing live interactive connection between patients and doctors or students and professional teachers, okay? Uh, ineligible grant purposes. These have not changed and we do still seem to have a little confusion on these. Application preparation costs are not eligible. Those are operating expenses. Neither are salaries, wages, or employees' benefits. Not fundable, period. No other operating or recurring expenses, including broadband connection fees. We, this program is not set up to fund your monthly broadband bill. The only thing that falls into operating or reoccurring is what we have been able to put into the regulation, which is the funding of three years of the maintenance. If it is bundled uh, in a three-year package at the time of purchase of the equipment. Uh, that's the only exception to that rule, and that's because that is written into the regulation. Equipment not having telemedicine uh, or distance learning as its essential function, and any cost incurred prior to RUS receiving your application. Okay, let's go a little further. Other ineligible grant purposes or building construction, renovation, alterations, we will pay for a minimal amount of inside wire if you need to run some inside wiring to get the DLT equipment up and running, but we, we can't wire your facility or rewire uh, a building. Uh, we will not duplicate facilities. So if you have got a grant with us in years past uh, and you submit the same end user sites, we're going, that's gonna raise a red flag. And projects that present to just connect different buildings in, uh, on the same campus in the same facility. Let's say you have a 
huge uh, medical facility and you've got some uh, multiple buildings, we cannot fund to equip building, uh, film funding equipment for a facility that is on basically the same grounds at the same address. This is to link to rural America, rural addresses. It's not to equip campuses. Okay, let's move a little bit further and I will again plug the distance learning and telemedicine grant application guide. That is a valuable resource. Okay, now let's move into completing a grant application. Okay, this is where the requirements are very important. You need to get these done early. Uh, let's go on to talking about the registration requirements. You must have an active registration in SAM.gov, which is the system for awards management. And it must be active prior to registering in grants.gov because grants.gov requires that in order for you to use their system. Uh, this can take up to 12 to 15 days. Get this done early. Your SAM registration must remain active the entire time you have an award with us. And you must certify to the financial assistance representations and certifications. This is a must, it, it has to be done. And if you're not careful when you're in SAM, if you're like a first time user, you will see that you will see the actual screen where you think you have made the <laughs> representation and certification, but indeed the system has kind of got a, a, a quirk in it. It's, it's intended so that everybody doesn't just uh, click yes without taking a look at it. But let's go to the next screen, please. With the application, you're going, when you get into sam.gov, you're going to get the message. Does this entity wish to apply for federal financial assistance? And the system defaults to no. You must go read that and change it to yes. And we're gonna give you an example of that on the next slide. This is what your screen will look like. And there is where it's going to automatically default to no. That must be changed to yes for financial assistance representations and certifications. Again, we have a lot of useful resources. Take a look at your application guide and it will also give you more in-depth instructions on how to do this. Um, it's very important that this gets taken care of early on because the next slide is gonna tell you about grants.gov. Uh, well, and when you do go into SAM.gov, it assigns you that unique identity identifier that replaced DUNS. If you were already a member of SAM.gov, they've already assigned you a UEI. You may still need to go in and take care of the financial uh, representations and certifications, and you, those are only good for one year, so you need to go in and renew them every year. Please go in and make sure that those are good through the uh, application period because we don't want you to um, for that to expire while you've got an application in with us and when we get to the review process it's not active. Um, another big point is the UEI must be for the applicant. You must apply for this grant in the legal name of the applicant. Please do not apply for it in a foundation name if the foundation is not able to contract with the federal government, carry out the application on the assets of the grant, um, please make sure that when you apply, you are applying for the true applicant. Uh, once we make the award, we're, we cannot go back and reassign um, that award to someone else. So if you get all the way to signing your legal documents and you realize that the entity that you used to apply for the application was not indeed eligible uh, to contract with the federal government or own the assets, then we have serious problems and you, you may lose out on some money that we would ordinarily have been able to provide you. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And we're still on the components of a complete application. So let's go a little bit further. Uh, I will mention uh, I think we have it further in the 
program, but I do want to mention here that uh, the SAM.gov, I mean, uh, the grants.gov, all of the application information gets uploaded into grants.gov. You have to have credentials for that as well. Those credentials need to be done as soon as you get your SAM.gov credentials because we don't want anyone waiting to the last minute and their system uh, get overwhelmed and, and you not be able to get all of your information inputted. The only form that is actually in grants.gov is the standard form 424. That is another one that is very, very crucial. Please use your legal name and uh, description of your entity on that form. Uh, we're not gonna cover that in detail, but we uh, have lots of instructions on that in our application guide. And there are some instructions on that in the, not only in the body of the application guide, but also in the appendix to appendix A of the application guide. Um, the rest of these you can read. We're gonna go over the majority of them within in a little bit of detail. And this is where I'm gonna try to go through and point out things that are of a concern or things that have caused people problems in the past. Okay, let's go on to the next slide. The, we, we are providing sample worksheets for every single thing that we ask you to do. You do not have to use these worksheets, but these worksheets will show you the type of information we need and what is the, the best format to present it for um, our reviewers and for scoring and for processing. Um, we're going to discuss the uh, project descriptions here in just a minute, but as you can see, we've got all these others and these are also available on our DLT website under the To Apply tab. So please use the resources that we're making available to you. Okay, go on to the next slide, please. And let's get into the description of project sites. Okay, the project sites is anything that is going to be involved in this project. We need you to give us the hubs, the end users, and the hub end users. And I'll define those, and those are defined in several different places. But the hub is where the content or the service being rendered comes from. It's either the um, university or the a hospital, it's where service begins. The end user is where the person receiving the benefit resides. You can have an, a hub end user. You can have the site both having uh, duties to prepare and deliver services. And you could also have uh, people there that are receiving services from other sites. So it doesn't have to be one or the other. It can be the combination. When you go to fill out the realities, uh, I will touch on the fact that you need to be listing every one, even though the hub sites do not, their numbers do not get calculated into the reality or the economic need, but we do need those listed on the sheets. Um, for the project sites, you will need to list the location and congressional district town, state, uh, and the congressional districts are on our DLT map. So that's uh, very convenient for you. That's also on the To Apply tab uh, on our website. You will list every location that's receiving grant funded equipment or that will function as a critical piece of the project. And then we will get into that. I'll touch on that a two, another time or two throughout the pre uh, presentation. So let's go on to the next slide, please. Well, let's talk just a little bit about the executive summary. This is basically your first chance of telling the telling your story. Um, the reviewers that come in and read and review these, you need you take this opportunity to, to give them a high level overview of what this project is, why it's needed, who how it's going to address the needs, and who it's going to benefit. You're gonna basically explain the total project cost and uh, what's gonna be match and what's gonna be grant. And you're going to have to tell us if it's distance learning or telemedicine. It does not have to be either or, it can be 
both. However, you have to designate what is your primary purpose. So, and we'll get into accounting codes here a little bit later on SUDA. Uh, and you have to tell us if, well, this is it. Uh, if you're going to reduce substance use disorder, um, it's SUD, not SUDA, my, my apologies. Uh, SUD is our short term for substance use disorder. And if your project is proposing to primarily address this, please be sure that you put that in your application in the executive summary section. You do not get special points for this, but there is money set aside especially for this. So uh, we need to know if you, if that is the main purpose of your project that you are proposing to reduce substance use disorder, we can use money that's not in the general uh, accounting category for distance learning and telemedicine. It has a set aside uh, specifically designated for that purpose. And then we will talk about special consideration points in depth a little bit later. Okay. Uh, we need an overview of the telecommunication system, meaning what's going to be connected where and to whom, um, the number of end user sites and Who's, whether they're going to be in users or hub in users or whether they're going to be purely hubs. Uh, you will discuss the application, uh, the applicant's relationship with uh, all the other participants, especially if it's a consortium. Uh, we will need uh, to know for sure that you, you will need to make the statement that this is not duplicating services. And um, we want to make sure that we put money where uh, it is needed the most, not to build over something that is already there. All right, next screen, please. End of the, ex end of the executive summary, there's this little item that we call publicly releasable project description. If you want to go see what we include in these, there are, are samples on our website. The main thing is tell us what your project title is, Tell us your end users and hub user sites and a brief project description and how many people are going to benefit from this. We've not been asking in the past for you to include how you arrived at this number, but this is a number that's hard to come by or how hard to back into. And when we write up the press releases, we want to have some idea of how we came about this number. So if you're serving children in a all the elementary schools in a school district, you would want to give us the population of all the children that might participate in that particular program. You would not want to give us the population of the entire county. It's you, I hope you see where I'm going with this. Give us an estimation of who this is going to affect. Uh, if you're putting in um, distance telehealth, site at a clinic out in a county and you know that that clinic can see possibly two or three telehealth uh, visits per week that's what you would give us you would not give us the um, total of the population of the county please on this uh, be brief when you go over and take a look at what's on our website you will see we're talking three or four sentences. So um, this is just a very generic, this is what we use to um, notify Congress and put out uh, press releases. Okay, let's go a little further. Now let's get into the fun part, the scoring criteria. Okay, we're still using the 2010 decennial census population on the census site. Um, the end user facilities will be scored. Um, you will need to score them on the reality site. You have to have a minimum score of 20 for it to be eligible for the program. Um, the information you will be wanting to use for these end user sites uh, for the reality scoring is going to be on the DLT map and the census data. And in the live demo, uh, Alexa will show you a little bit about the DLT map, which will help you understand that better. And of course, we've got the link to the map. Okay, let's go a little further. 
Um, for non-fixed end user sites, let's say you have a university and you want to provide classes for students out in a rural area, but they're not going to be in a specific location. That's non-fixed. Well, for non-fixed, we do use the hub information. Therefore, if the hub site is in an urban area and all you have are non-fixed end user sites, meaning is that they're not in a stable permanent location, then it's not eligible because you're gonna have, if it's in an urban area over 20,000 and you have no rural end user sites, it doesn't meet our definition of live interactive serving rural locations. And there's a lot more information in the application guide. So please take advantage of that. And let's go to the next screen. Okay, the economic need. This is again, well, let's, let's go back to the reality screen for just a second. I may have uh, blown across the description of project sites. Let, um, the description of project sites is where you're going to list your hub, your hub end user, and where they are. On this, when you do that, please let that set your precedent for all of your worksheets, for, for providing all of your information to us so that they are presented in a consistent manner, that you identify site number one as Jackson County School Elementary one, uh, and then on down, make sure that you are consistent throughout your application and throughout your spreadsheets that you provide information on us. And that starts with your description of project sites. And that carries through on reality. We're gonna want you to do that exact same thing, make sure they're in the same order. And now you can roll forward to the economic need, please. Okay, when you get here, you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna put the uh, information on a worksheet showing uh, each of those sites and how they score. And the scoring information is now also on our website. There is a, um, access to a spreadsheet on our website under the to apply tab that gives you all of the um, SAPE poverty percentage information. And SAPE is small area income and poverty estimates. With this, you can use that, but we've made it even easier. There is a SAPE layer on our VLT map now. So you can get that information very easily when you're over in the DLT map. Let's go a little bit further. Okay, this is our scoring points. You get, can get a total of 30 points for this. And uh, this is according to poverty percentages. And um, there is a considerable amount of this discussed in the application guide. So I won't delve into this too deeply, but if we do have questions and time, I will get a little bit deeper into this. Okay, the next slide, please. Special consideration scoring. This is always interesting and uh, is one of the few things that changes from year to year. And so with this, we want to uh, we'll spend just a little time on this. It's not complicated at all. However, it is a little different from what we've seen in the past. Um, this year, you can get 10 points from any one of these categories. We are asking on your special consideration worksheet that you explain to us which one of these you are claiming your 10 points under. We are also asking that you provide us with additional information should you actually fall under multiple categories. You're only gonna be able to get 10 points but for tracking purposes and for future rounds, we would like to know if not only you were serving on tribal land, which is where you're claiming your 10 points, which I'll again remind you must have a tribal resolution, but go ahead and say, well, I'm serving on tribal land, but I'm also covering an area that's considered farm worker community or that's in a distressed energy and I'm doing some of the other projects. Now, farm worker community is uh, basically taken from 
where the um, USDA has funded some housing in um, through their Rural Housing Service Farm Labor Housing Program. So that is a layer on our DLT map. Uh, if you, you may have to scroll in very, very closely to see, some of those are fairly small. Uh, the distressed energy community is also a layer on the community, on the, the DLT map. And those are communities that are fossil fuel dependent and whose economic well being ranks in the most distressed tier of distressed communities index. Again, we provide you with excellent resources if you want to know more about each of these topics. Um, again, please share with us everything that you're targeting, but make sure you spell out in your uh, executive summary and on the worksheet, your special consideration points worksheet, what you consider to be your primary and the one under which you would like to be given points. Okay, let's go to the next category. And this just gives you a little bit more information of what I gave you and stresses again, tribal res resolution is not provided. That means you didn't get permission to work on tribal lands unless you are the tribal entity yourself. The application is not gonna be eligible. So pay special attention to this. And we do provide you with a sample in the DLT application guide in Appendix A. All right, let's go a little bit further. The other two categories under which you can get 10 points is a project that supports Native American languages. And for this, uh, there's the um, information that we've given you on um, in the application guide that tells you where this comes from. It actually comes from the Native American Language Preservation Act of 2006. And to get these points, you basically need to, of course, explain everything in your uh, executive summary, and you'll need to make sure you include these points or on how you're going to meet this and uh, accomplish it, what language you're going to be supporting, what the qualifications are of the instructor, and the number of students that will be served by this project. Um, there's additional information in about all of our resources on uh, what Native American language means for this program. Okay, let's go a little bit further. And there is also the fifth category that you can claim 10 points under. And is if your project is primarily to support mental health services, that doesn't mean it can't support other things. But if your primary purpose is mental health services, you can explain in your uh, executive summary and the needs benefits section, and also make sure that that coincides with your special consideration worksheet. I hope you're, you're picking up on a theme that everything needs to be consistent throughout the application. Make sure you don't have conflicting information in your executive summary and all of your supporting materials. Okay, let's go a little bit further. The needs and benefits, scoring up to 30 points available. This is an area that is subjective. Everything else we covered was objective. You can actually go and find what your score is going to be by following the instructions we gave you. This is where you can make your application shine and stand out from other applications. This does not need to be lengthy, but you need to tell us um, the economic, educational, or health challenges facing the community that you're going to serve. You, you do not need to repeat any economic statistics that are accurately picked up or reflective in the economic needs SAIT score. But if there's something above and beyond that, tell us what it is and how you're addressing it and what the challenges are and provide documentation that demonstrates these challenges and substantiate and quantify these challenges with verifiable data and statistics. Uh, uh, another big plus that we often see people slide right over, but address why the applicant can't afford to do this project without our help. Uh, we want to fund projects that could not go forward without uh, the distance learning and telemedicine grant. Also, 
provide us with some supporting documents from professionals in the educational healthcare field, showing us that, you know, backing up your claim that this is indeed a need. And I've already stated that uh, you don't have to duplicate the data that's in the economics need scoring. So let's go a little bit further into this 30 points. Evaluate the benefits derived from the service proposed by the project. You're going to want to identify, quantify what your expected outcomes are. Don't just say we're going to have more high school kids graduate and go to college. We want you to quantify your expectations. We expect 20 seniors to take dual enrollment classes and go on to college. Um, something of that nature that you don't use those that exact example, but hope you understand that kind of gives you an idea of what I mean. And tie the benefits directly to the stated needs that you've already said are there. Uh, one of your stated needs could be that, you know, we, we are not graduating enough seniors and the ones that we do graduate don't have enough high, high math to uh, score high enough. So they're having to take remedial math classes to get into college and that hinders some people, they don't go the extra effort. Whereas if they, this had been addressed in high school, they would have been college ready and pursued a, you know, a, not necessarily just a college degree. Uh, we're seeing a lot more emphasis placed on um, trades. So, you know, if they had a the correct background coming out of high school to go into a trade, they might be much more likely to go into a high earning trade rather than um, not pursuing any education at all. Provide measurable targets and goals. Okay, please continue. And this is another area that gets overlooked quite frequently, and it is the address the local community involvement in planning, implementing, and financial assistance. You need to convince us that you're not just out there doing this project on your own because you think it's the right thing to do. You need buy-in from the community. You need community meetings, public forums, surveys. You do not have to include us, you know, um, 50 pages of support, but we do have people who don't provide any support that they have worked with the community. And don't just say we held community meetings on dates, this, this, and this. Give us a little more information. Uh, we invited these um, economic development leaders, these hospital leaders, these school leaders, the county commissioner, uh, and this was the topic discussed, this is how many attended, and this was the outcome. Something simple like that, but please show that you have uh, participation from the community. And this is again, uh, somewhat repeated in my second statement, that uh, community-based organizations are willing to support in making this successful, whether they provide you with some of your financial match uh, with a financial commitment or just a commitment to support and use and encourage the public to use this program. Okay, let's go to the next slide, which is our matching requirement. The matching requirement has not changed. It is still 15%. It cannot be from a federal source unless that federal source itself says it can be used as a match for federal grants. So in general, it can't be from a federal source. It can't be from E-rate. It can't be from uh, block grants that just get federally handed down to the state. That's still really federal. It's just being passed through. So. Uh, the 15% match can come from the applicant. It can come from um, foundations. Uh, it can come from individuals in the community. But you have to have a letter of commitment to the match amount to include with your budget. And with this, it has to be um, specifying the amount that they are. Don't please don't tell us that they're willing to give 15%. Tell us that, that they're willing to give $150 uh, 
Uh, we need specifics. We don't need the percentages because should we have to deem part of your grant ineligible uh, because something was included in the budget that was not eligible, then that 15% gets whacked away. So uh, if they say that they will provide $150 and we have to do something different, then they've still committed to $150 and you've not lost part of your match. Uh, we can accept in-kind, but in-kind has to be new, non-depreciated, and you have to be able to establish the value, which basically means providing us with an invoice. And uh, it cannot be vendor discounts or the vendor supplied equipment. And uh, it has to be something that would otherwise be eligible in the grant, whether it was being funded by match or not. I mean, there's no difference between what is eligible for grant funding and for match. Uh, of course, the cleanest uh, cut is uh, the cash match. And when you do a cash match and you submit for reimbursement with your invoices, we send you back the federal percentage. Whereas if you're doing an in-kind match, then there's some, some prorating and some calculations that go on. It's a little bit more complicated. But if you do have something, it can't be something that um, has ever been installed before. It has to be new. So there's not a lot of things that are actually eligible for in-kind that uh, fits into this specific project. Uh, we do not have to have a uh, match from the American Samoa, Guam, Virgin Islands, and the Northern Mariana Islands. This means if the project is wholly on that, um, let me see, the applicant resides there. Uh, we can't have an applicant in the United States that just has one user inside in the Virgin Islands and that be eligible for the waiving of the grant requirement, I mean, the match requirement, it has to be that the applicant is in one of those locations. And if any part of uh, an item you put on your budget can't be used as match, uh, just consider that uh, it could change whether you have, whether you meet that 50% requirement or not. So let's be careful and only put on the budget things that are eligible. Okay, let's go a little bit further. Uh, I've already mentioned federal funds are not eligible. Uh, we do know for a fact that the counties under um, in Appalachia and the Appalachian Regional Commission are in their, have in their statute that they can be used. So if you are in the Appalachian region or you think that you might be one of those areas, it would be worth checking into. Um, they do provide funds and those funds can be used as matching contribution. And your letter must be explicit about the purpose of the grant and not have limitations or exclusions. They can't say we will give you $150 if you uh, build to our school first, <laughs> you know, it, it's gotta be a, a flat out there supporting the project. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. And now we're gonna get into the scope of work. The scope of work is basically that, it's you telling us exactly what you're gonna do in order to make this project uh, be successful, all the steps. You're going, who's going to carry them out? What are the time frames? What are the objectives and what are the activities? Uh, you're going to do, you're going to go by the budget and you're going to tell us what everything on the budget does and why it uh, is needed and how it applies, you know, to this project. A lot of information on this in the application guide. There's also uh, information in the appendix of the application guide that walks you through a budget worksheet. Again, you don't have to use our budget worksheet, but it is there and it already gives you the information uh, that we're looking for. And it also already includes the formulas. So uh, we're trying to make it as easy and consistent as possible. Uh, when you submit your worksheets for uh, into grants.gov, everything is an upload, remember, except for that SF-424. So when you upload your worksheets, I would highly recommend you upload them both in PDF and in Excel 
we are almost always needing an Excel of the budget. So if you would not mind giving us both a PDF that way, we'll all have a record of exactly what you gave us and providing us with uh, an Excel, if nothing else, an Excel of the budget worksheet. Okay, let's go further. Now we're gonna jump into the financial information and sustainability. And basically this just has, uh, a, like I said, it's something that sometimes gets glazed over in the uh, information packet. And if you'll notice on these, the completing a grant application is broken down into tabs. It's tab A, B, C, D, and financial information and sustainability is tab G. If you would separate your application into and name each tab accordingly, that speeds up the review process tremendously. You don't have to do that. But if we get an overwhelming amount of grant applications and everything is lumped in one PDF and we have to go and parse it out, um, it does really slow down our application review. So these are some helpful hints that you can do to help us uh, review your grants and get them scored and awarded much more quickly. So financial information and sustainability, like I said, is tab G. And it's a narrative telling us how the project is feasible. And one of the most important pieces that does not get covered is how will the project be sustained following completion? Uh, we, we're not putting this out there for the use for three years. We want this to be used long after our project window has closed. So again, identify any items that might affect your feasibility or the sustainability of the project. Okay, the next slide, let's go to the statement of experience. Statement of experience, we need a narrative basically, and please no more than three single spaced pages telling us your organization's capability or experience in operating an educational or a healthcare endeavor. You don't have to have done one before, but we need to know that you've got the people and the resources to make this a success. So please give us uh, enough background to uh, tell us what your credentials are, or if you don't have credentials to make this work, how you're gonna overcome that lack of experience. All right, the next slide is the telecommunication systems plan. This is important and there are times that this just gets ignored and this is a vital piece of the grant application. If you do not provide us with a telecommunication system plan and one that includes both a narrative and a map or diagram, we're gonna have to send it back because we cannot adequately review your project without this. Um, the system plan narrative basically tells us what you're gonna be working with. Uh, it's a description, let's go to the next slide. I think I might be repeating myself if I don't. Uh, it's a description of the overall network uh, and the use of the proposed equipment, um, the scope of the work and cross-reference that with the line items on the budget and the justification of equipment based on discussion with technical experts. Um, I can assure you there are more electronic changes in the last 24 hours than any of us could ever keep up with. So it is very important that if you are not a technical expert yourself, that you have those discussions and that what you put in your budget is um, going to accomplish what you're setting out to do. We will have engineers review these when the applications come in. We are very aware that from the time you submit to the time that we release your funds, things will have changed and scope changes are um, absolutely eligible. We want these all to be um, successful. I mean, it could be that you could have had two end user sites that were rural hospitals and one of those hospitals closed before we got you know, the application processed and awarded. We will work with you on scope changes, but they have to be approved by us if they are indeed scope changes. Now, if you've got a version two of a telemedicine cart. And when you go to buy it, you can buy something later, greater, newer version three for the same amount of money or less, then you don't have to ask us, can you do that? Um, it's when you're making changes to what you're doing, 
um, how you're doing it. Um, this is not an example for DLT, but let's just say you were going to um, deliver, this could be an example, you were going to deliver something wirelessly and you decided to change and go fiber. Those are the things that we're talking about are scope changes. If you change an end user site, if you change a hub, um, those type things are scope changes and they need to be discussed with us before you take any action on them so that we can make sure that we properly document, approve, and can reimburse you for what you eventually implement. Okay, we'd also like to know if you've had any uh, previous DLT grants and applications. We are to uh, going now to where we only approve one grant per entity, um, just so that we can make our funds go further. Um, if you have two distinct projects that you want to submit an application on, you're welcome to do that and we'll review them um, equally. And But if they're both eligible, we will only fund the highest scoring one. So, um, and if you put the same identical application in grants.gov a numer numerous times all the way up until the deadline because, oh, I forgot to add this. Oh, this would make this better. You can do that. We're only going to review the latest and greatest when the window closes. So uh, if you want to go out there and you submit one and later want to change it, there is the option to mark that it's a change. But we're you, if you don't mark it's a change, it's okay because if it's a, a duplicate project, we're only going to review the latest and greatest information you've provided. Okay, the system plan map diagram. That's, that's the narrative of what you're going to do, the equipment you're going to use, what it's going to accomplish, um, and that you're not duplicating any services that are already there. The map and diagram is going to be showing us basically in a picture, and it, it can be any type format. It doesn't have to be to scale, but we need to see in a picture the service area of the project where the uh, information, whether it's the medical service or the telemedicine service originates and where it's going to end up. And so we, we need that information and it should include uh, all the sites, hub, hub and user, um, and the combo uh, where it can be both. But yes, we need all of this. And if it's going to be the uh, non-fixed sites, then you will basically have to show that on the map that this is the area where we plan to target um, the non-fixed end-user sites. Again, remember when you do non-fixed end-user sites, the hub is where the scoring comes from. So that could definitely hinder your scoring unless it's also in a um, rural area. If it's in a rural area, then you don't get into uh, a problem with your scoring. Okay, let's go one step further. And this is compliance with federal statutes. There are some other uh, information that you have to adhere to. And we have a checklist that we provide for you. And it is an important part of the um, submission of your application. It's also on our website and it's in the application guide. And on that checklist, please don't just go down through there and check, I did this, I did this, I did this. Please read each item because these items will definitely come back at some point. And if you're if you're not paying attention, we'll we'll run into some problem areas. Three of the uh, four of the items that are on the checklist are the flood hazard area precautions. When you check that, if you check that it is in a flood hazard area then you need to go on and provide us with the additional information we are asking. The others do not require any additional uh, discussion, just that you have read them and you uh, agree to adhere to them. Other items on the checklist are all the items that are on the completing a grant application. Uh, the check, checklist asks, you know, did you include the 474? Did you include the description of project? sites, did you include reality and each of the other things? So you're going to be checking all of those off. There is uh, another item that uh, 
we will need to cover if you are a consortium, because if you are, then we need the uh, evidence of legal authority to contract with each entity. So um, that would mean you would need uh, to provide us with everybody's uh, unique uh, entity identifier and everyone's reps and certs and everyone's uh, legal authority to contract with the government. And when I say legal authority to contract with the government, that's not just being registered in SAMS. Uh, you, we explain in the application guide, if you are an entity that is uh, established within the state, and all states are a little bit different, but for the most part, if you have been established within a state and you are not a school system, more than likely you're going to have uh, something out on the Secretary of State uh, website that says that your business is in good standing with the government uh, or is in good standing, I should say, not necessarily with us. But, uh, and if you are, let's say um, a school that is established under uh, a county or a federal entity, you have the information showing where that was legally established. That's the type of information that we're looking for, for legal authority to contract with the government. Uh, if you have any questions about that, uh, we do want you to use the resources that we make available, which is, again, I've mentioned a zillion times, <laughs> the To Apply tab on our website. Uh, we do have application guide, we have the notice of solicitation of funding, we have the uh, regulation, and we have a help desk, plus we have general field representatives in that covers every state. So uh, there's always uh, someone that can help you get through the little quirks that you're not sure if your entity falls into one of the categories or not, or it may be something kind of Hey, you know, I could consider myself a public body or I could consider myself a part of government. I'm not really sure. Um, reach out to us. Reach out to the contact us um, help desk and submit that question. I highly recommend when you do that, that you, rep you put in there what state that you are uh, proposing to serve in and um, a detailed question that way. Uh, we can hand that off to the general field representative that works in your state, and he can, he or she can be a resource to you. You can reach out to our general field representatives for technical assistance up until two weeks prior to the deadline. Uh, we, we ask that you reach out to them very early and very often. Please don't wait to the last week or two before the deadline. Uh, we could have them out on other assignments and they might not be available. That's one of the reasons that we cut their technical assistance. Um, our uh, offer of technical assistance off to us, that doesn't mean that they won't help you if they're available. But uh, we can't have everybody waiting until the last two weeks and bombarding the staff with, with questions and then being um upset with us because they couldn't get all their questions answered in the last uh, 15, 17 days. Okay, let's go. We've, we've hit on the other federal statutes. Let's go to the next slide. And this is the piece of the checklist that I just referred to. If you are in a 100 year flood plain, fine, you check that. But if you are then you need to check the other box and provide us with additional information. And by reading these, reading the particular um, uh, statutes, the Uniform Relocation Assistance and Real Property uh, Acquisition Policy Act, we're actually including those. And by reading those, all you have to do is sign and date this one form instead of copying, printing, signing, dating, all four of those forms. If you will do this on the checklist, you will have set aside all four of those um, other statutes that you're required to comply with. Okay, let's go one slide further. This is the 
evidence of illegal existence and authority to contract with the federal government. Let's go on. And this is where I've already said once, and that's one of the reasons I covered it a few times. This is one of those important things, legal existence. Please provide us with your, if you're a corporation or an LLC, please provide us with evidence of good standing in accordance with the laws in the state where you were organized. Same thing, if you're a school or school district, provide us with a copy of the statute or resolution or other document that confirms your existence and your legal name. Please always use your legal name. Uh, if you do have a doing business as, you can provide that as well, but we need the legal name because when we get to the process of preparing grant agreements, that's what it's gonna be. And uh, with the volume of interest we have, there's going to be a lot of awards, hopefully. And we definitely need to do our grant agreements right the first time, if at all possible. We do not need to be trying to go back and correct for uh, having the wrong name again. Be sure if you're a foundation that you can and you're applying that you can own the equipment and um, implement the grant. Uh, if not, be sure it, the application comes in in the name of the entity who can. Uh, SAM registration, you have to provide us with a copy of your res, uh, registration. It has to be current and it you have to show us that the financial assistance representations and certifications have been made. That's where I showed you change that no to yes uh, and make sure that these are current and active prior to submitting your application. Um, you will have to have your entity name, your uh, uh, EUI and SAM registration and uh, all of that will play into your um, submission in grants.gov. Let's go one step further. Environmental impact. This is a sit, um, situation where a lot of these are just equipment being put in existing buildings. And in that case, you think uh, there is no environmental impact, which you Gee, really, in reality, there's really probably not any, but this is a required piece of the application. You must tell us that this, you know, where this project is going to be and whether it is going to uh, affect environment. If it's going to affect the environment, then you go on further and fill out additional information. This information is available in all of our resources, but please don't just overlook it and say, oh, that don't apply to me tell us that you're acknowledging that the project that you are going to do is not going to have any effect on uh, the environment or uh, historic preservation. So please don't just toss that one out the window. Okay, we're getting close to the end. Let's go a little bit further and catch on the consultation with the USDA State Director. This is not an exact science. We do tell you what we want you to do, and we do recommend you reach out as early as possible. Uh, if you reach out really early, you may not have completed your executive summary to provide to the state director, uh, and you may not even know your too many of the specifics. Of course, we only have a 60-day window, so you don't have a lot of time to be deciding on the specifics or the grant amount and the match amount. So, as soon as you can, contact your state office uh, of rural development and ask, give them a little information on whatever you can, that this is your project, this is who you plan to serve, and ask them for a letter saying that you have notified them. And there's a little bit more of information uh, in the application guide. We're giving you a list of the state offices. Uh, the state offices do this every single year. However, over the past couple of years, we did go through a period of having acting state directors. So some of the state directors that are actually there on a permanent position right now may not have been a party to doing this before. Uh, they may want to see your application. And if you don't have it, you can always provide it to them at a later date. Uh, that's not mandatory. Usually they're very happy with the executive summary. But if you're doing a project that has end user sites in multiple states, you need a letter from every state director that your project involves, where, where you're delivering this medicine. Now, let's say 
you have sites that are in Wyoming, the hub where the actual education is a university in Alabama. If that's the case, you don't have to have a letter from the USDA state director in Alabama unless that hub is also going to serve as an end user site. You have to have state director letters anywhere there are end users. Uh, same way I will kind of throw back to the tribal resolution. If you are crossing or delivering service on land for more than one tribe, you need a tribal resolution for every one that you are serving on. Okay, we have ran through a lot of material and we're going to uh, move along now and uh, I will remind you of some of the basics. We do have the application window open until 11.59 p.m. Eastern on January the 30th. Uh, we currently have uh, 64 million. Uh, we are still undering, under a federal budget continuing resolution that ends on the 16th. Hopefully before we uh, wrap up in January, we will have a full budget. And if we do, we may have some 2023 money. So the only thing that we can tell you now is that we do have the 2022 money because we did not do a funding, uh, typical funding window in 2022. I'll remind you to get your uh, sound.gov registration and then uh, subsequently your grants.gov registration uh, as quickly as possible. The only thing that is um, actually filled out in grants.gov is the SF-424 and it is uh, everything else is uploaded as an attachment. Again, if you separate your application out into tabs, uh, that is very helpful. And be sure to be consistent throughout your whole application. Make sure your narrative matches your end user sites and that your end user sites are or all of your sites are consistent throughout all of the worksheets. If you do not, um, if you drop an end user site, let's say you've gotten to the end of this and all of a sudden one of your end users does not want to participate, please remember to go back and take that out of all of your information. Because when we get ready for you to do this, we're going to want you to provide us with progress and performance reports showing how you've implemented every single thing that you told us you were going to implement. Uh, I have seen where people were maybe using a grant writer, which I need to touch on that. And the grant writer just took their cookie cutter template and plugged in people's names. And then lo and behold, you get over to the web to the one of the worksheets and they don't even match the company, uh, the entity that's applying. So uh, if you use a grant writer, that grant writer cannot participate in uh, helping in the grant, in the implementation. They can't be a vendor. They can't bid on any of the work. Um, everything in these applications, they have to be done by a third party. And if you want your employees to install the equipment that you're purchasing, that's perfectly fine. But be aware, we don't pay for that. If the vendor does not, if you don't pay the vendor to install, we still can't pay you for uh, the salaries or a cost associated with the installation. The only way we can do that is if you hire a third party to do that. Uh, we cannot accept vendor donations. Um, that kind of goes against the rule of uh, Code of Federal Regulations 2 CFR 200, which is another um, topic all in itself of procurement. And we will have the GFRs cover that very well with applicants uh, once you have been awarded a, a grant. Okay, let's, um, I think I might have gotten a little bit ahead that we're, we've got resources uh, on the, the website under the To Apply tab. There's tons of information. If you want to um, make the very best use of all of your resources, I would recommend you read the regulation, 7 CFR 1734. Read the notice of um, 
uh, opportunity uh, solicitation of applications, the NOSA, and read our application guide. Read uh, all of through all of the spreadsheets, worksheets. Read the little synopsis of past awards. Look across our web map and please take advantage of all the resources that we've given you and the Contact Us um, help desk. And last but not least, do not hesitate to reach out to your general field representative. They are the boots on the ground. They have, well, we do have a few new ones. And if they do, they have mentors, so that's fine. But many of these have done this for many years. So they're very well versed. So for the majority, unless we get into some gray area or a new use of technology, for the most part, they can answer your questions. So don't be shy about asking questions. We'd rather you ask and good applications come in. And with that, I think we're ready to transition into Alexa Petty, giving you a live demo of how to use the census website and the DLT map. Alexa. Awesome, thanks Teresa. Uh, we will go ahead and begin that demo of finding the rurality score for your project site. Okay, so as you can see here, we're on the census website. And from here, you're going to use this advanced search option that's underneath the search bar at the top of the page. And then from here, you're going to click on the geography tab, which will open up a few more options for you. And next you want to select the place tab. From here, you'll select the state or territory that your project is located in. And then you'll be given the option to select multiple cities or towns within that state. So I'm going to go ahead and select a few here. Okay, so you can see that I've now been filtering on these few cities and towns that I selected. So I'm going to hit the search button at the bottom right hand side of my screen. From here, um, you're going to be looking for the P1 race table. And you can see here there's over 3000 tables available to me. So I'm actually going to just type in P1 in the search bar here so that we can filter out those results. Okay, so you can see the P1 table has populated and you have three different options available here. Teresa mentioned during the presentation today that we will be looking at the 2010 census. So you wanna select the 2010 summary file. And this will pull the population for all of those cities and towns that you selected. So Anderson has a population of 282. Huntsville, just over 180,000, and Rainsville, just under 5,000. So based on the um, DLT program, we know that the population for Anderson would give us a preliminary score of 40 points, Huntsville, zero points, and Rainsville, 40 points. So like I said, this is a preliminary score. We now have to Look at the DLT map to identify whether these are adjacent to urban areas. Um, so we are going to now navigate over to the DLT map. And I did see in the chat and the Q&A that some folks were having issues with the map. Um, I've noticed a little bit of a lag today myself. So if you have any issues, just make sure you refresh um, or clear your cache and try again. That's seem to clear up the issue today. So. so when you navigate to the map, which you can find on the DLT website under the to apply tab, you'll see a bunch of different layers turned on. This is what's uh, automatically populating on the map when you get here. We mentioned today the distressed energy communities, the farm worker communities, tribal lands, um, and congressional districts. So these are all things that you can find on the DLT map to help you as you're identifying the scoring criteria for your project. So right now we're just looking at the rurality of our 
um, areas that we searched on the census website. So I'm going to turn off some of these layers to just reduce the clutter on the map. So we're just looking at this non-rural areas layer. So from here, you can see that the yellow areas on the map are those non-rural areas. So we're gonna go ahead and search for Anderson. And as you select the location on the search bar, the map will fly to that area as you just saw here. And as you can see, this is not in one of those yellow areas, meaning that it is considered rural. So again, the yellow area is non-rural areas. It's not adjacent to those non-rural areas. So we can conclude that the preliminary score we got based off of this census um, data is in fact the score for this um, particular site. So this one would get the 40 points. Let's go ahead and look at Huntsville. So again, you can see here, this is confirming what we saw on the census website. We uh, concluded that we would get zero points based on the population. And you can see Huntsville is obviously in a non-rural area, no question about it. It's very yellow here. So um, that would confirm the census population and the score that you would get from um, that website. And that is just a quick demo on how to find the rurality score for your project sites. At this time, I will turn it back over to the slideshow presentation so we can start on our Q&A. And we have quite a few questions in the Q&A box today. So if we don't get to yours, um, just remember, you can always use the contact us form available on the website, and we've been putting that in chat quite a bit today. So um, please feel free to use that if we do not get to your question today. Um, and Teresa, I'm actually going to take this first question that I saw pop in about the SAPE data on the DLT website. Um, the spreadsheet that was showing up was the 2019 SAPE data and the application guide references the 2020 data that has now been updated. However, the, um, the map is still being updated. So please go ahead and use that 2020 um, file that is now updated on the website. So if you have any questions about that, again, please feel free to reach out through the contact us. Okay, thanks, Alexa. Okay, Teresa, the next question is, will there be a second competition during calendar year 2023? Uh, it is very, very unlikely. I expect this to be the only application window. We have a very limited number of staff running a large number of um, projects, uh, programs. Uh, I'm pretty sure a lot of you have heard about the Reconnect broadband program. And uh, that's a very high dollar time consuming. And the DLT does not have a staff. We use the staff from uh, that services all the pro programs. So uh, even I, I do anticipate there's a real good chance that we, if Congress passes a budget, that we get to put more money into this round, but I don't think we'll be able to get in another round. Uh, for this to be such a small program, it is extremely labor intensive. That's why I've given you so many helpful hints of things that you can do to help us do our review and do a better job. So I don't think that there will be a second round. Now, Congress could always come up and do a special project like the CARES Act a few years ago. And if that's the case, they can mandate that we do another round. So I don't expect that, but that doesn't mean it couldn't happen. All right, thanks, Teresa. The next question is also um, somewhat related to the map. So on the DLT mapping tool, the congressional districts are displayed using the state code and district number, for example, 4812. Do you want folks to enter that on their forms or you do you prefer the, like say Texas-12, for example, for the congressional district? 
that is something that as long as you give us the information, we're not really particular. When we go to do the announcements with Congress, we do have to have the, the state like Texas 01 or, or Texas 01, 06, 09, 012. So you will see on your um, just site description worksheets, there's a column for that. And you can give us that. Uh, we're not going to be really particular on the format, but just be sure you give us all of the information so that we can uh, make sure that we cover every area that you are going to be serving. All right, thank you. The next question is, what are your policies on remote patient monitoring by a hospital's home health department? Okay, remote patient monitoring is one of those lovely areas that we could spend a, a good bit of time on, but I'm, I'm going to basically say that that would be a non-fixed end user site. So the scoring for the end users for that would have to come from the hub. So if the hub is in a rural area, that wouldn't be a problem. If the hub is in an urban area, then that would really be a problem on your scoring. You might not score high enough to be in the funding uh, group, even if you were eligible. Uh, with that, we have to have live interaction. So monitoring is one of those that the equipment is changing as we speak and there is more capability. Uh, in the past, we have looked at monitoring as just being something that sends data to another location. It is not connecting a doctor and a patient in a real-time doctor visit. So that's not to say we would not fund monitoring equipment, but you would have to specifically tell us how that meets the definition of telemedicine for USDA, not how it meets the definition of telemedicine, you know, in general, because we agree that's, that's great, it's useful. But how does that meet our definition of live interactive? So the purpose and meeting our definition are the criteria that you would need to use in deciding whether that is an eligible project. You, that's one of those that you really might want to speak with your general field representative and uh, drill down a little deeper into your particulars. Uh, we cannot write your grant for you. We cannot even tell you, you know, this is a good project, this is not. But our GFRs can answer all types of technical questions. Uh, and once you describe your particular situation and the particular equipment, there's a good chance they can say, you know, this really doesn't look like it meets the definition or it really looks like it does. So that's one of those areas that gets a little complicated, but we are more than willing to work with you. We want to get good rural health care out there. And I do think that some of these um, pieces of equipment, uh, if it were a piece of equipment like a nurse was using uh, an electronic blood pressure cuff while she was out there seeing a patient and that was in real time talking to a doctor at the hospital, you might consider that monitoring equipment. And in that case, there would be the live interaction. So uh, uh, again, a gray area, we need to know a lot more of your details before we can tell you whether that really fits into our program or not. All right, thanks, Teresa. Next question is, if an organization has a current DLT grant that is closing in the next few months, can the organization be an applicant for this grant period? Yes, and in the past we had uh, been very careful if you were kind of building on a previous project and it wasn't finished, we have to take a hard look at whether we can fund a new project because, you know, if it's dependent on something else uh, happening, we don't want to give you a new grant dependent on you completing the last one and the last one not being completed. However, if these are two totally separate projects, not dependent on anything in the previous project, then there's no reason you couldn't apply again this year and next year. Like I said, we're only funding one per entity per year, but you can apply every year as long as they are uh, separate 
distinct projects. Uh, you don't need to duplicate end user sites or uh, make it dependent on some hub equipment that you were installing in the first one before you could be able to you know, expand to uh, other locations. Uh, if I didn't address that adequately, please put that in the contact us. But yes, you can apply again. Great, thank you. Well, let, me, let me add a little bit. We would want you to uh, explain what your last project was and the status and you know your, your plans for completion. That would help us make a good decision. Great. Next question, if non-tribal applicants who are looking to include locations on tribal lands, um, is the tribal resolution from the relevant tribe necessary for project eligibility, even if the applicant is not looking to claim the tribal land special consideration points? Yes, if you plan to put anything on or across tribal land, you have to have the tribal resolution. Awesome, thank you. Can an applicant stagger equipment purchases between years one and two? Yes. Um, that sometimes that's very necessary. Uh, we, it, you have the three-year window to have it fully installed and implemented and meeting the uh, criteria that you set forth for your project, but everything does not have to be installed within the first year. We do highly recommend that you get moving on it quickly because those three years go by very quickly, and sometimes there's uh, supply chain problems and, and different Things. So please don't put off, you know, down into your halfway through your second year or into the beginning of your third year, because when that happens, then we see lots of problems and sometimes people can't complete. All right, thank you. The next question, are applicants required to include multiple quotes in an application? And if so, how far back can they consider a quote? Yeah, we need some support for how you came up with your pricing. Um, you can't actually agree to purchase something from a vendor because that goes directly against the procurement rules. But to get quotes, we would want those quotes to be relatively current. Um, I wouldn't have a problem taking a quote within the last six months. Uh, I really think with the inflation, I would not want to take a quote further back than that right now because I'm just afraid it might not be realistic. Uh, and there's not a set number of quotes, but if you could definitely give us more than one, uh, that would help us establish the, you know, the realistic dollar figure that you've included in your budget. Great. And we were just talking about tribal resolutions. So in what section of the application should those tribal resolutions be included? Okay, the tribal resolution can be included at the very end in the supplemental information, which happens to be tab N. Um, uh, it's, it's okay if you put it somewhere else in the application, you can put it right behind the narrative, you could put it with the um, special consideration point worksheet, but um, it's perfectly fine to put it in supplemental information. That'd be the first place I would go to look for it. Okay, the next question for section B, the description of project sites. The guide states that the applicant should include the number of rural residents that will be served by the project at each end user and hub end user site. Um, they're not seeing a column for this on the sample worksheet that was provided. So should they include this requested information as a separate narrative or um, can they include that on their own worksheet? How do you want them to display that information? Okay, I wasn't aware that we did not have a column for that. Uh, that basically gets discussed in the narrative. So um, I would be perfectly fine with you putting in the narrative, the end user sites and hub end user sites uh, with the amount of people being served at each location. Any, I'll just tell you anything that you don't know where to put it, put it in the narrative. If we've not given you a clear uh, guidance. Uh, there's a lot of information here and some of it was moving parts and pieces. So when in doubt, put it in the narrative. All right, thank you. 
Can you provide examples of awardee owned broadband facilities? I cannot. We put that in the reg several years ago to make it available. And we have not had anyone apply for it that has made it through the eligibility and the scoring. Um, there's just not much of a demand for that because you would basically be having to own a pole line or buried fiber and equipment to connect to um, internet service provider, whether it's a telephone company or cable company or otherwise. So most applicants are not interested in owning broadband facilities and, you know, having the upkeep and the responsibility for that. Plus, the, the only broadband facilities that we can fund are what is necessary for the project. So you couldn't put in broadband facilities to get it out to your rural clinic and then plan to serve houses out in that region. Uh, it is strictly for the DLT project only. So I can't give you any examples. We haven't had anybody that has taken that route. The next question is also on the tribal resolution, and I can take this one. They're referencing the different layers that are available on the map. Um, they asked if the tribal resolution is required for non-tribal applicants looking to bring services to the tribal statistical areas and tribal supplemental areas. So those are some of the tribal um, layers specifically that are available on the map, and the, the answer is yes, those are considered tribal areas. So you would be required to submit the tribal resolution. Okay, Teresa, the next question is, can a match come from a partner such as a parent organization? Yes, there's no restrictions on that. Uh, the only restriction would be from a federal source. So um, you can get matching contributions from about anywhere except for there and from a vendor. Okay. I'm just reading the next question. Okay, regarding duplication of facilities, if you're requesting a project with a completely different programmatic purpose, for example, a school-based health program in place where they have distance learning equipment in place to do dual enrollment, would this be considered duplication of services since they are doing something different with different equipment? If the equipment is not capable of providing uh, the delivery of both services, then it would not be, but that would need to be explained very in depth in the narrative. And um, I would actually put in an entire paragraph explaining why this, what type of equipment is there when it was purchased and why it can't do what you're proposing that you, for the equipment that you're requesting now. So if it is totally different purposes and the equipment that is there will not do it, then it's really not duplicative, but you got to be sure that you make that clear. Because if we just automatically see your location, your end user sites are the same uh, and you're asking for equipment, then, you know, it's, it's going to be questioned as to whether that, you know, is duplicating adequate service or not. All right, thank you. Can eligible equipment that's currently in the equipment fleet qualify for the match? Read that again. Can eligible equipment currently in their equipment fleet qualify for match? I'm assuming um, they might be referencing the new equipment versus current equipment that they might have. Um, and if that's not the case, then if y'all can just put a clarification in the Q&A, that would be helpful. Okay, I'm thinking that you might be saying that we've bought six computers that we have in inventory that we now want to pull out and use for the distance learning project. 
If they have never been used, new, undepreciated, you can show us the invoice when they were bought. So if we have a value, um, that would possibly be considered for in-kind match. Um, but typically it's new purchased equipment. I don't know a lot of cases where we have had anybody with uh, equipment that qualified. And, and yes, feel free to expand on that question in um, the chat or to contact us or with your GFR. All right, thank you. If an applicant is trying to claim the location-based consideration points, so for example, the tribal lands, distressed energy communities, farm worker communities, how much of a focus should they have on these components in their application? For example, if two of their 10 end user sites are located in distressed energy communities, can their application still get those points? Yes, as long as one of your end user sites falls into one of those categories. But where we come into predominant is if you want to get substance use disorder funding, then that needs to be the predominant uh, purpose. And if you're going to uh, treat mental health, that needs to be the predominant purpose, meaning the majority of your end user sites would be getting that type of service. But for those that are location-based, one end user site is sufficient. All right. Um, the NOSA assumes a static location or hub. What about a proposal that would use a mobile classroom, such as a bus with mobile telecom equipment? Would this be eligible? Well, a mobile bus would be in user site. That would not be the hub. So uh, in most cases, now I can't say that it couldn't be, but a bus that would would go out into a rural area, that would be non-fixed. And then the scoring would be based off wherever the hub site is, which is where the content that is being delivered, whether it's medicine or education, uh, originates. Now, if you're saying the mobile van is where it originates, then we'll have to uh, know more about the project because you know if if your teacher is in the mobile van going out in the rural area we we're, we're needing the distance between the student and the teacher there needs to be they can't be kind of on the same campus so uh we wouldn't want a medical um an educational bus going and parking in the parking lot and teaching the kids that are driving up in the parking lot on a Wi-Fi. I mean, that's not distance. So, uh, you know, you could give us another example and maybe I can give you a better answer. Great, thanks, Teresa. The next question um, is distance learning for adults also included? They state that the NOSA implies that they would be supporting schools, but can they also serve adults through distance learning? Absolutely. No limit. Great. Okay, next question. May a hub have or serve user sites across state borders? Yes, yes. I, a project can include sites all across the country. If the hub is in an urban area and there are multiple rural end user sites in different counties, can the hub site be the applicant and can equipment be purchased for both the hub and rural end user sites? Yes, and we do expect equipment to be purchased for the hub site and for every end user site. And if you're gonna have a hub site that you plan on using that does not need equipment, then that's a, another category, another topic. If let's just say they've already got the equipment they need, then we'll, that would have to be explained very well. Uh, and they would still be the hub, but we don't usually do hubs that don't get equipment. Uh, we also have um, the situation where um, you wouldn't, it to, to be an end user site, we have to fund equipment there. 
All right, thank you. Next question is, um, can staff time be considered an in-kind match? Did you say staff time? Correct, yes. No, not at all. That's considered an operating expense and we do not fund salaries overhead of any shape or fashion. The only thing that we can fund that can, would be something that comes in from a third party vendor on an invoice. All right. Um, along those same lines with the match, could a current equipment lease work during the grant period? No, we will not extend current leases. Oh, it has to be something that is unique and specific to this project. Okay. Next question um, is around applicants can only um, submit one grant per entity. So this individual says they have multiple areas that they'd like to support with the DLT grant, including mental health, telemedicine, um, language, distance ed. Can all of these be identified in the same application? Yes, they can. In regards to the evidence of legal existence, is this required for tribal governments? No, tribal governments do not have to supply that. All right. If an applicant meets more than one eligibility requirement, so for example, this individual says that their entity is both a local government and 501c3, should they include both or just choose one to apply under? I would choose one to apply under, and then I would put the uh, specify that it qualifies as both under the narrative. All right. Um, this next question, I believe you touched on this earlier, but we can restate just in case folks didn't hear. Can you share the total funding available for this round? And do you know, um, do you think that this will be increased whenever we get into the 2023 budget? Will they add more dollars before applications are um, through the review process? Okay, right now we have 64 million and we are under the continuing resolution. So uh, we don't have a 2023 budget with any money allocated to us. Uh, I definitely hope that we have a budget before the end of January and I fully anticipate that we have money in that budget. And given the fact that there's really not enough manpower or time to implement a second funding window, I anticipate, and this is based on my gut feeling, is that we will get to add more money to this. And the last several years, we've gotten about 60 million each year. So um, we have 64 now there's a chance that we'll get 60-ish uh, in the 23 budget. So keep your fingers crossed. This could be a really big year and we could get to fund a lot of applications if we get that money in our hands in time. All right, great. Can you provide some examples of the proof of legal existence uh, can this be articles of incorporation, IRS determination letter, et cetera? Okay, the evidence of legal existence would be where you are incorporated, and that typically comes from the state in which you were incorporated. And then for um, government entity, it's usually a copy of the statute where that particular government entity was established. Um, I'm not, I'm sure there's some other categories. Uh, the articles of incorporation will tell us where you were incorporated, but it won't necessarily tell us that you are in good standings with the state in which you're incorporated. So I would rather see something from the Secretary of State website showing that you are an existing entity and in good standing than see your um, articles of incorporation. All right. Do tribes, um, if they're the sole applicant, need to contact the state director for um, their state 
consultation with the USDA state director? I have not been asked that. And I would assume that we would like for you to. I don't think that we would. I think you would probably be the only uh, entity that could be exempted. Um, we would like for you to work with the state director and that the state director know what you're doing and um, that they kind of give you their thumbs up and support and that they're aware that you are trying to benefit er uh, people in your area. But that is the one area that I do believe that we would absolutely not uh, require a state director letter. All right, thank you. Next question is completed through contracts. Can this be considered as instructional material that is covered under the program? Okay, I'm, I'm probably gonna need some more information. Instructional programming is course material. And you're asking if somebody else delivers the coursework. We do not, we, we pay for the asset, the actual coursework. We don't pay for the delivery, the teaching. We don't pay the teacher. We don't pay the doctor, um, those type things. So we will pay for a third party to develop a curriculum for you, but we do not pay for them to deliver the curriculum. Did that answer the question? I think so. And if not, please feel free to uh, type some more information in the Q&A box or send us a contact us if we need to get some more details about your project. OK. The next question, um, their hub is one mile from a distressed energy community area on the map. Will they count as a distressed energy community? The question is, are they going to be serving anybody that falls within the distressed community? That's where, it's where your end users are. If you don't have any end user sites that fall within the area, then No. Earlier. 